Hey and welcome back to freephotoshop.com and video tutorial number 19 in this series looking at the levels command. Now a word of warning before we start things off here, the next four videos are going to get pretty advanced. And when I say advanced I mean we're going to be dealing with some pretty complicated notions about histograms, both in the sense of the statistics they provide and the way we view and read them on screen. Now we've already looked at some of the essentials as far as the histogram goes, way back in videos 3 and 4 of this series, and over the next 4 tutorials we're going to build on that knowledge. After all this isn't stuff that you necessarily need to know to be able to work inside levels, but I guarantee you that you're going to find an overview of these functions, at the very least, extremely helpful as you build your experience up inside levels and Photoshop in general. So I'm going to get us underway by directing your attention towards this document I've got loaded up on the screen here. And chances are, since I've been gibbering on for the last couple of moments, you've probably already read most of what we've got on screen here, but just to make sure you understand it, we're going to go through it once again. So Photoshop supports three variations of the histogram in an RGB working environment. And I'm focusing in on RGB because that's where we've been working all through this series and it's by far the most used colour mode in all of Photoshop. We will be looking at lab colour or LAB colour, whichever you prefer, before we finish this series, but for now, let's just focus our attention on the RGB colour mode. So the three types of histogram that you may want to use are, first of all, the standard RGB histogram that allows us to view channel-related brightness levels based on colour information and that's the histogram you'll find inside the levels dialog box which is where we've been working throughout the majority of this training series. Next we have a luminance histogram that allows us to view the luminance levels of an image based on a human's perception of light and it's interesting to know that the human eye is far more responsive to green light than it is to blue light for example but we'll be looking at that in more detail in a couple of tutorials time Finally down here we have a colour histogram and that allows us to view the three colour channels of an RGB image inside one histogram. And this is based on colour information rather than luminance. And by the way, I'm not referring to any kind of composite histogram here. What I mean is that the three colour channels are displayed separately inside the same histogram. Now, we'll be discussing the three different histograms inside the next three videos, so stay tuned in order to check them out. My objective is to give you all the information and demonstrations you need to understand what's happening in all of these different histograms. For now, I'm going to switch to the next image, a photograph of the Flatiron Building in New York City. And I'm going to start by dragging out the histogram. Then I'll just collapse the rest of the palettes and make sure they're all folded away like so. That's a new feature of Photoshop CS3, by the way, that you can collapse these palettes over here onto the right-hand side of the screen to keep them out of your way. Now I'm going to click on the wing menu of the histogram palette and select the All Channels view. And I'll just move that over towards the edge of the screen so it's not blocking out too much of the image we have on screen here. So let's have a look at what this palette is giving us in the way of information. First of all, we have our channel selection drop down menu up here, and we get to choose which version of the histogram we're seeing. And you can see that the three variations we talked about before are all here the RGB, the luminance, and the color histogram. I'm going to stick with the RGB version whilst we work through this particular video. We'll be looking more at the RGB histogram in the very next video, so stay tuned once again for that. Now, here's something that you perhaps wouldn't realize. When you make any changes to the image, Photoshop goes ahead and redraws the histogram. Another one of those brilliant dynamic functions. The trouble is, it doesn't redraw it based on the image pixels every time. Instead, in order to save time and processing power, it draws it from the image cache that it holds in memory, and that's basically a downsampled version of the image. So the amount of cache levels that the histogram has used is displayed down here and you can change the default cache levels inside the performance options inside the preferences dialog box which is inside the edit menu. Generally there's not a problem working this way but if you do want to see the most accurate version of the histogram possible then either change the cache level to 1 
and then restart Photoshop. Or you can either press this little refresh button up here at the top of the histogram or press the little yellow warning icon just below it here to invoke the most up-to-date histogram Photoshop can calculate. Now you'll see that the histogram changed ever so slightly when I hit that little icon and the cache level down here has returned to 1. OK, so let's take a look at this pretty hostile section down here full of statistics and information. The image source, first of all, is a nice simple one to get things started off with. At the moment it's greyed out for me and that's because I'm working with a flat image. If I had an image open that contained layers, then I could set the source to whichever layer I wanted to work with and just have the histogram represent that particular layer instead of the whole image, which is what we're seeing here. Next we start to find ourselves in some pretty deep waters actually, starting at the top here with the mean value. And what's happening here is Photoshop's taking one channel at a time, which is how most of these figures down here are being calculated by the way. So it's taking the first channel, which is actually the red channel, it's adding up the brightness values associated with just that red value for each pixel inside the image. It's then dividing that by the total number of pixels it's used to reach its sum. That gives a mean average for the red channel. So just basic maths going on there. It's then performing the same calculation for both the green and blue channels. And once it's done that, it takes the three average values and basically averages them out into a mean calculation. The result is what appears here under the mean value. Now, just to give you a sense of what's happening here, I'm going to switch over to this image here entitled the mean calculation. And what we have here is a four pixel image. That's all we have going on inside this particular document, just four image pixels, which consists of one red pixel, one blue pixel and two white pixels. I'm going to drag out the color palette here to help us evaluate what's going on inside the brightness levels of this very small image here. I'm also going to hit the letter I on the keyboard to access the eyedropper tool and you can select it from over here in the tools palette should you want to go that way but hitting I is by far the easiest way to go. Now just to confirm what value we have over here as red I'm going to click inside the pixel and well that's definitely not the color of the pixel and I've just realized the error of my ways actually. I've still got the sample area set to 11 by 11 average up here in the options bar. So we're averaging the colors from all four pixels. We don't want that behavior at the moment, so I'll switch this setting back to point sample. Now if I click inside the red pixel, we get a true picture this time inside the color palette as to how that pixel is built. We have a brightness level of 255 in the red channel and zero in both the green and blue channels. But at the moment, we're only interested in the red value, which is 255. Next, I'll click inside the blue pixel and see that we have no red at all inside this particular pixel. That's fine. Finally, I'll click in the white pixel, and of course, we get a maximum red value, once again, of 255. Next, I'll bring the calculator into view, which I have here on the Windows system and I'm going to work out the mean value of the red channel based on the values we've taken from the red channel here in this image. So that's 255 plus 255 plus another 255 and then we can add in that zero which we took from the blue channel if you remember rightly and now that gives me a total of 765 now I'll divide by 4 to get the mean value of the red channel and that's going to give me a mean brightness level in the red channel of 191.25. Now if I perform the same calculation for the green and blue channels, I'd get values of 127.5 and 191.25 respectively. And I'm not doing the maths in my head by the way, I've just made a note of this before I came on screen here, before I started recording this tutorial so that I'd have this information without having to take you through every step, which would probably bore the heck out of you. Then what we do is add those three mean values together and divide by three, and we'd end up with the mean brightness value of the image, which as it turns out is 170 brightness levels, which we can see under the mean value of the histogram palette. Okay, I'm going to minimize the calculator out of the way, 
Then I'll put the color palette back into the palette well. And that's the collapsed palette well, by the way. You can actually move palettes around when they're collapsed, which is, again, another great feature of Photoshop CS3. And that's just tidied up the screen for us here. OK, so now let's take a look at the next line of information here inside this particular palette. And that's the standard deviation value. Now, what does standard deviation actually mean? Well, the first thing you should know is that it's a very, very, very complex mathematical equation that's going to alert us as to how far in brightness levels the bulk of pixels inside the image deviates from the mean brightness level. As I say, a very complex calculation that really does fall outside the boundaries of this tutorial. But if you do want to know more, then I'd suggest doing a Google search for the term standard deviation and you'll be able to apply the mathematical theory to this value here inside Photoshop. For now, let me give you an example of what it's actually telling us. If I go ahead and switch to this image here called New York Flatironed, a fairly drab and low contrast photograph of the Flatiron building in New York City. Now I'll open up levels and accept the default name for this adjustment layer. Now at the moment, you can see that this image has a standard deviation of 36.47 brightness levels. And I want you to keep your eye on the histogram in the histogram palette up here, opposed to the one inside the levels dialog box. And if I change these output sliders here to values of, say, 50 and 205, you can see that we're pushing the histogram into the center. So more of the image brightness levels are hanging out around this mean value, which incidentally has dynamically changed. And because the bulk of brightness levels are deviating less from this mean value, we're getting a lower standard deviation. Now if I do the opposite, so I'll just reset these output values to their original settings. And now I'll set the input white slider to 205 and then the input black slider to 50. We're now getting a larger standard deviation than we did before because the bulk of the image's brightness levels are straying further away from the mean value. And that's pretty much what's happening here with standard deviation. OK, next is the median value, which in maths is another variation of the average. Once again, we're working on a channel by channel basis. So we're taking all of the intensity levels from the red channel on a pixel by pixel basis. We're then arranging those values in a string of numerical data and then selecting the value that falls directly in the middle. And I've noticed from trying this a few times, as sad as that may sound, usually when we're calculating a median and there were, say, for example, two numbers that fall into the middle value, we'd go ahead and take them two numbers, work out the mean, and then use that as the median value. Well, Photoshop seems to round the number down instead. And I may not be seeing the whole story there, but that's what I've seen in my experience of trying to work out what's going on here anyway. OK, the next value is a pretty handy one too. It's also a much simpler calculation. We're now looking at how many pixels are inside the image. And this shot we have on screen here at the moment was taken using a 7 megapixel digital camera. So I'd expect to see around 7 million pixels inside this image. And sure enough, we have exactly 7,077,888 pixels that make up this image. The next three values allow me to query the histogram itself and collect an assortment of information from it. So you'll notice that if I hover the cursor above the histogram, I start filling out the information in those three slots. So if I come over here, for example, and try my best to hover above the first brightness level, which is zero, and this can be pretty tricky, so have a little patience if you're trying to get just one brightness level. Once you're done, you'll be glad that you spent 10 minutes of your life trying to get your cursor placed on a single brightness value inside this histogram. OK, I think I'm there if I can keep the mouse still for a second. So at zero brightness levels, which is where we are, we have a count of 110 pixels that have either a red, green or blue value of zero brightness levels. So if we were evaluating a pixel that is black, so in other words, it had a red, green and blue value of zero in each channel, then Photoshop would actually count the pixel three times. The final value here is the percentile, which measures the percentage of pixels that fall at 
or before the brightness level we're actually evaluating and the way it works is that the first brightness level zero has to be zero percent and the highest brightness level on the right hand side of the histogram over here has to make up 100 percent so we get to see the distribution of brightness levels throughout the histogram as a percentage Another handy thing to note is that we can select multiple brightness levels to evaluate. So I can attempt to select the first brightness level and then drag the mouse over to this side of the histogram to select everything and the stats will tell me I have level 0 to 255 selected. I have a total of 21,233,664 possible brightness levels going on inside the pixels keeping in mind that every pixel in the image is being evaluated three times and in all that's adding up to a percentile of 100 percent nothing more and nothing less okay here's another way you can affect the histogram you can believe it or not make a selection inside the image so here as a quick example I'll go ahead and select the basic lasso tool and I'm going to make a real quick selection of these trees down here just so you can see where I'm heading with this. Now, once I have the selection active, we're now seeing just those pixels being evaluated by the histogram. I can also move that selection area around to use as a kind of magnifying glass effect, where I'm magnifying the confines of the selected area into the histogram. Not all that helpful as far as this image goes, but you could use this on other images to find where you've got problems. I'm going to go ahead and deselect the selection outline and then refresh the histogram by clicking the refresh button like so just to wrap things up here. In the next three videos we're going to spend some time looking at how Photoshop creates the RGB, the luminance and the color histograms. And I promise you some things that we've discussed during this series are finally going to make sense when you understand how Photoshop and how Levels creates these histograms that you see on screen. Well, thanks for joining me here at freephotoshop.com. I'll see you in the next video.